approaches at understanding uh, life at a higher level are suspect until confirmed at the molecular level. So really we can only understand life if we understand it at the molecular level and of course that's what we uh, do as chemists. So hopefully you'll find um, at the end of the lectures you've got a very nice chemical appreciation of how some of the um, components of life work. And here is here is an example of this. So here we can see the amino acid tyrosine um, and this amino acid is part of a much larger structure. So what you can see here is that it's part of a polypeptide chain that forms um, a protein and then several protein chains come together to form this structure that we can see here. And we can see the secondary and tertiary structure here. And then as we um, add the space filling in, we can start to understand what the function of this molecule is. And so we can see that in fact, there's a, a channel down the middle of the molecule um, and that tells us how this this molecule function. So in fact it's a bacterial potassium channel and um, it's activated by, um, by pressure or, or changes in the cell membrane structure. Um, and this helps bacteria deal with changes in pressure either inside them or, or externally. And if you genetically remove all of these types of um, proteins from the bacteria and then drop them into water then they explode because they can't deal with the changes in pressure and so clearly this is very important for bacteria um, but we can see that we can understand this and we can start to understand it at the molecular level and so really this takes us through uh, the structure of the lectures so we're we're going to start thinking about amino acids and then we will go through and ultimately by understanding the molecular levels we'll start to understand the function of the proteins as well. Oxygen, uh, we now have a 2s22p4 atomic configuration. We're now well past the midpoint of the first period, and as a result, oxygen has a very high Z effective and electronegativity. The minus two oxidation state showing here um, dominates, and in that oxidation state, we're going to have highly directional lone pairs, which will influence both the structure and reactivity uh, of oxygen containing compounds. It's an essential element for us, and as shown here, it is highly oxidizing. The elemental form at room temperature is a diatomic gas, has a very low boiling point and melting point. And like nitrogen, this is consistent with strong multiple bonding within molecular O2 and weak molecule molecule interactions. Oxygen combines with almost every other element in the periodic table, and in doing so forms a variety of minerals and ores. There are two stable allotropes of oxygen at room temperature. O2, often referred to as dioxygen, is molecular double bonded molecule with a short oxygen-oxygen bond length and the other uh, well-known allotrope of oxygen is O3 otherwise known as ozone and we'll talk about the structures of both of these. So oxygen gas is, is colourless, it condenses at low temperature to form a blue liquid and then at much lower temperatures to, to a blue solid at atmospheric pressure. As you can see here nitrogen boils um, 13 degrees lower than oxygen and therefore we can conveniently use liquid nitrogen to prepare uh, liquid oxygen by condensing the pure gas. Now I've mentioned already that the principal origin of these molecular interactions that we're considering in this course are the van der Waals interactions. And the origin of these attractive intermolecular forces is in every case the electrostatic interaction between asymmetric charge distributions in molecules and those asymmetric charge distributions can arise from uh, uh, various um, structures and processes and that's what we're going to now look at. Um, asymmetric charge distributions could be um, of many different varieties. Um, I'm showing here on the right uh, the fact that a dipole is the simplest asymmetry um, uh, we could move to higher order uh, there's a quadrupole, octopole and so on but in this lecture we are considering only dipoles um, and you will have encountered dipoles and the concept of a dipole moment in the course in Michaelmas term called physical basis of um, chemistry um, where it was defined that the dipole moment um, of a bond in a molecule is equal to Q multiplied by the vector R between the atoms so the vector um, mu is Q multiplied by R um, Q being the charge separation and you will also have encountered the idea that a, um, a molecular dipole moment can be calculated from the resultant of the bond dipoles. So bonds which have um, um, uh, 
uh, dipole moments uh, pointing in a similar direction can augment one another, end up with a large moment, and um, on, conversely, they can cancel as shown in these uh, diagrams. So these are all concepts which I think you are well familiar with. Um, here are a few examples to remind you that molecules which contain um, polar bonds, such as um, these ones here, the dichlorobenzene molecules, can uh, result in very different molecular dipole moments, but depending on how those um, uh, uh, polar bonds combine. So in the case of the uh, paro, uh, paro dichlorobenzene, the um, over resulting dipole moment, molecular moment is zero. Uh, whereas the meta and ortho uh, dichlorobenzene give higher moments as shown. Um, and on the right hand side we can see some typical dipole moments for molecules which have um, greater or lesser separation of charge and bond length. Um, and you'll see that they're in units of Debye and this is um, a very common way of describing uh, dipole moments. One Debye is equivalent to 3.3 or so times 10 to the minus 30 coulomb meters. So how do those uh, um, dipole moments, which might be permanent di dipole moments occurring within a molecule um, or otherwise, how do they combine to give rise to these van der Waals interactions that we are uh, talking about? Now, van der Waals interactions um, can be categorized into three varieties. Um, the top one here is called the interaction between permanent dipoles. Um, so that would be molecules which have a permanent uh, dipole moment. Um, and those are called orientation interactions. Uh, the second class of van der Waals interactions are the interactions between a permanent dipole and an induced dipole. We will consider what that means shortly. And this is also called the induction interaction. The third class of van der Waals interaction is the interaction between two fluctuating or induced dipoles. Um, and that is also known as the dispersion force or the dispersion interaction. But nonetheless, this is a landmark paper uh, in showing that chemistry could be done for the previously thought to be inert uh, noble gas elements. So just to kind of summarise why, why that might be, um, if you're asked to explain why the noble gases have relatively little chemistry, then a, a slightly flippant answer would be just to quote the octet rule. Uh, but of course, that's, that's more of a description rather than an explanation. The, real, the, the underpinning reason uh, why the noble gases don't have much chemistry is that they hold on to their electrons very tightly. And so forming covalent bonds or ionic species by a complete loss of electrons is very difficult. And this can be quantified, uh, if you like, by looking at the first ionization energies of the noble gas elements, which are listed here in this table. They're all very high. Um, ionization energies uh, of course are proportional to z effective over n all squared and the fact that noble gases come right on the right hand side uh, at the end of a particular period means that z effective has increased spectacularly uh, going across the period and hence these elements within a given period are the most difficult ones to ionize but of course ionization energy as well as depending on z effective also depends upon n uh, and hence, if you wanted to find uh, a noble gas element that gave up its electron uh, or shared electrons more easily, then you would naturally look lower down uh, within the noble gases. Uh, so krypton, xenon and radon, for example, uh, would be uh, elements to look at. Krypton uh, is marginal. Uh, the ionization energy is still pretty high, 1351 uh, kilojoules per mole. Xenon. Uh, more uh, more uh, chemically accessible and also radon though of course uh, radioactive radon is actually quite difficult to come by so as I mentioned most of the chemistry has actually been done uh, with xenon so I1 is actually less uh, than for oxygen uh, and, and for fluorine for, 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 for xenon um, and that means xenon does actually have um, a reasonably extensive range of chemistry although restricted to being partnered with relatively electronegative uh, elements such as fluorine uh, or oxygen and to, to a much lesser extent nitrogen. So shown in the bottom of this uh, slide is some of the uh, well-known chemistry of, of xenon fluoride. So the reaction of xenon under different conditions gives rise to uh, a range of, of fluorine containing compounds 
under mildest conditions we get XEF2, uh, a bit more forcing conditions, uh, XEF4, uh, and then really, really beating on it, you can make uh, XEF6. And all of these are col colorless and volatile solids. And uh, as you will have realized, they, they're actually quite good uh, proving ground for questions on, on VSEPR. What is machine learning? So the idea is uh, computer scientists have been interested in this for a long time, building computers that can learn in the same sorts of ways that humans learn. Uh, and we have a bit of an idea, don't really understand how the brain works, but we have a little bit of an idea about how the brain works. Um, and it has these neurons uh, where they sort of get activated at one end and then information gets passed along the neuron in the brain and then it does some kind of output. And we have a whole load of these neurons in our brains and they're all kind of connected together and this is how the brain works. Um, and this is how, one of the ways that people have been trying to produce uh, artificial intelligence, computers that can learn uh, by mo basically modeling it on the way that humans, we think humans learn. So what they do is they create something which is called a neural network, and that's uh, over here, and this is also known as deep learning. And the reason I'm telling you about this is because these neural networks run completely on linear algebra, completely on matrices. The idea is that you have some vectors, which are the inputs to your, uh, to your machine learning algorithm, uh, and then they kind of get processed in some way by this thing that says hidden here, but this is really just a whole load of matrix algebra, matrix multiplication, matrix uh, inverses, all this sort of stuff. And then they process it in some way, uh, and then that then gives you some kind of output. So we're sort of modeling a neural network on the, the idea of modeling how the brain works, but we're using matrices and computers to do the, to do the processing. So you might have heard in the news uh, two or three years ago, I think it was, uh, that Google uh, famously beat uh, the world's best Go player. Go is a kind of board game uh, at, uh, at Go. And they did it using this computer, which uh, they built this custom hardware. I think this costs $25 million. Um, but these computers are basically doing all the number crunching, all the matrix uh, algebra, matrix multiplication uh, that I showed in the previous slide in order to, to kind of to create an artificial brain. So that's what this uh, big computer is, $25 million. The reason I'm sort of telling you about this is because actually um, chemists are now starting to think, can we use machine learning uh, as a way to, to do chemistry? And there are lots and lots of applications of machine learning that people have been thinking about. Uh, and um, I'm not gonna tell you about all of them, but, but one idea is perhaps if a computer can think, if you can, if you can produce an artificial intelligence, maybe that artificial intelligence can uh, work out how to synthesize molecules uh, by some kind of synthetic route planning. And there's lots of papers being written about that at the moment. Uh, other people are looking at drug discovery, um, quantum chemistry using machine learning, maybe interpreting spectra, interpreting NMR spectra, getting computers to do it. So I guess, the point I'm making is that as we go forwards in time, we'll probably be seeing a lot more of this machine learning uh, in chemistry, and it's all basically based on, um, on uh, matrices and linear algebra.